excitedly opened the box for the programs and immediately burst into laughter. And because there before us was a brand new English word for the dictionary. And it is that word on the front of your program, perfidity. There is no such English word, and it wasn't in the advice that I gave those who were responsible for printing the program. But I had a laugh because what it illustrated to me was that it's an unusual word, but I chose the word for very real reasons. Because we wanted something that rhymed with praise, and you can see that's the last word of the title of our series. But we wanted something that encapsulated the character of Judah before his conversion. And that word does it perfectly. Now, you can cross out the IT before the Y at the end. You'll find it also on the next page, and the page after, you can cross out the IT. So, some wag quipped, there's too much IT around here. <laughs> now, you know what IT is, of course, don't you? It's uh, information technology, it's the acronym for that. And then someone piped up, I, I will mention the name, it was Simeon from the West. He said, well, I don't think there's a, enough IT, because if they had looked up the dictionary or typed it into Google, it would have told them there wasn't any such word as perfidity. It's perfidy. So what does perfidy mean? If you look up Webster's Dictionary, it means the act of violating faith, a promise, a vow, or allegiance, and therefore it means treachery. Treachery and deceit. And we're going to find that that is exactly the description of Judah's character until we get to Genesis chapter 43 and 44. His life revolved around that treachery and deceit and self-interest. So that's why we've titled this series From Self-Serving Perfidy to a Scepter of Praise. You will never find in the Word of God a greater reformation than this one. And God tells you that. Because in fact, brothers and sisters and young people, at the end, in Genesis 49, the end of Jacob's life, under inspiration, through God, we are told that Judah assumes a position higher in the scheme of things than even Joseph himself. That's the case. Even higher in the scheme of things than Joseph himself. That's telling you something about the conversion of this man who began awfully and ended wonderfully. So that's the study before us over the course of the next few days, God willing. But before I launch into it, I thought I should make a comment because, you see, in considering the life of Judah, we are going to be considering a lot of tragedy. Tragedy brought into his life by the intervention of God, which he recognised later on, as we see. He recognised the hand of God was working in his life. But of course, it would be impossible for any of us here, and certainly for those in the local area, not to be heavily weighed with the tragic events of recent days. We can't help but have that in the forefront of our mind. And it will be that way for some time. But I want you to know that this study on Judah was put together a long, long time ago. So, if any comment that I make occurs to you as being related to the current issues and problems and tragedies, please excuse me, because it's got nothing to do with it. Well, but some may judge and say, yes, you could apply that, but I haven't designed it that way. There's absolutely nothing in what you're going to hear from me that was designed for any present, current situation here or anywhere else, and I will take personal aim at no one. But if you're not affected by this, then you're made of stone. You will be affected by it, and it will dig into you from time to time, because all of us, at times, act a little bit like you, all of us. And we, as Graham said in his, in, in his remarks, need as much reformation as he does. And God is at work in our lives to achieve it. Now, just another technical thing before we launch into the study. Some of you have downloaded the material that's on the, apparently on the Enfield Dropbox site. If you didn't get to do that and you want some more extensive notes, because I'm going to have to skip over a lot of stuff, detailed stuff, in the course of our studies, 
there will be two of these little USB sticks. One of them is hanging on the wall in the library behind me here. The other one will be in there. If you have a USB device, for those of you who are technically uh, uh, you know, competent, you can go in there and download. There's the PowerPoints that I'm using for my notes, my speaking notes, and there, of course, is a 15 or so page document of Bible marking notes on all of the sections that we'll be covering over the course of this next few days. So you can go and get those in your, at your own leisure. It was Paul who wrote in Hebrews 7 verse 14, for it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah. Both Mary, of course, his mother, and Joseph, who was regarded by the Jews as having legal paternity for our Lord Jesus Christ, descended from David, whose descent was from Judah. And Judah is unquestionably a major character in the book of Genesis. Not always for the right reasons, as we're going to see. But he is there as a major character in that section of the Word of God. His marriage, his sons, two of whom Yahweh slew, his character brought disgrace to the family of Jacob. But his complete conversion, brothers and sisters and young people, makes him the leader and the restorer of his brethren. And when Jacob comes to bless his sons, it's Judah that becomes the royal tribe. It's Judah from whom our Lord Jesus Christ would come, the chief prince. So here we have a man whose life story is very, very important to us. So what are we aiming to achieve? We want to explore the lessons of the conversion of Judah from profligate to reformer to become the leader of Jacob's family. We want to consider how the birth of Phares and Zara through his daughter-in-law Tamar sets the scene for the unfolding purpose of God through Abraham. We're going to see some absolutely marvellous, pristine allegories which line up beautifully with the allegory that we've just read in our readings today in Galatians chapter 4. We're going to see just how wonderful. In fact, the allegory of Galatians 4 occurs three times in the book of Genesis, as we'll see. And we're going to see that a little later in our studies, God willing. We're going to have a look at the red cord that was placed by the midwife on the hand of Zara, who should have been born first, but ended up being born second. In quite remarkable circumstances. We're going to see what all of that means in the scheme of things. And follow that red cord through the scripture to Matthew chapter 1. We're going to see how important the story of Judah is to the work of our God in Christ. And, towards the end, on Monday morning, God willing, we're going to have a look at the massive prophetic implications of Judah, as far as you and I are personally concerned. We are going to be involved in things very shortly, brothers and sisters, which are all there couched in the prophecies that surround this man, Judah. So that's where we're aiming. But I want to start with some foundations. You know, it was probably in excess of 45 years ago than when Uncle John Martin was doing Jacob here at Glenlock that Brother Max Lund came and chatted with me and said he'd found evidence, strong evidence, uh, that Jacob was in Haran for 40 years and not 20 years, uh, as if you just a casual reading of the record might tell you. Now, most of us, of course, are fully aware that Jacob was in Haran for 40 years and for not 20 and he gave me some proofs. Well, I was too young. It all went over my head at that stage of life. And, you know, sort of... It wasn't until I came to do my own study of the life of Jacob that I looked into the evidence. And there is very, very strong evidence that he was in Haran for 40 years. And you might say, well, who cares? What's that got to do with Judah? It's got a lot to do with Judah. Because unless you get the foundations right, then you're not going to have something to build on. We need to get that foundation. I just want to spend a few minutes then having a look at the evidence that Jacob was in Haran for 40 years. Now, 40, of course, is the number of probation, as we're well aware. So, we know from the details that are given in Genesis, certain times and stages of Jacob's life, and you can work from the end of Jacob's life, he dies at 147, he went to Egypt at 130, you can work back from the end of his life, but you don't have a lot of detail in terms of timings towards the beginning. So what age was he when he left to go to Haran, when Esau was threatening to kill him? 
Was he 77, which he would have had to have been if he was only there for 20 years, or was he 57, which he would have been if, of course, he was there for 40 years? It's got to be one or the other. So I want you to come to Genesis 28. Genesis 28 and verse 9. Now these are the facts. Jacob was 15 on the death of Abraham. You know, Paul makes a wonderful comment in Hebrews 11. He says that by faith, Abraham sojourned with Isaac and Jacob, dwelling in tents in the land. Well, that means, young people, that means that Jacob had the faith of Abraham, or at least the beginnings of the faith of Abraham, when he was 15. Because Abraham died when he was 15. So Paul's telling us something about the early life of Jacob. He was not one of these idiots who wasted his time as a teenager. He put his head down. He had the faith of Abraham at 15. Alright, so that's the first thing we recognise. So he was 15 when Abraham died. At that time, Ishmael was 89. And you can't, these, these are simple facts. Ishmael died at age 137 when Jacob was 63. Okay, so when Ishmael died, 137, Jacob and Esau were 63. So what do we read in Genesis 28 and verse 9? Well, verse 8 perhaps. And Esau seeing that the daughters of Canaan pleased not Isaac his father, then went Esau unto Ishmael and took unto the wives which he had, Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebuchadnezzar, to be his wife. Now, how does that read to you? Well, it's pretty clear, isn't it, that Ishmael was still alive. That Esau could go to Ishmael and obtain a wife from him. He's still alive. Well, did you remember the facts? Ishmael died when Jacob was 63. So if Jacob was in Haran for only 20 years, he left, he left home when he was 77. All right? When he was 77. But if he was there for 40 years, he left home when he was 57. It's pretty clear, isn't it? Now, that was one of the proofs that Uncle Max Lund told me many, many years ago. Uh, and it's, it's good. But I like to start with what people say, oh, well, it could be the case. But let's step it up. Let's just put the pressure on a little bit, shall we? Let's come to the next one. I want you to come to Genesis chapter 31. Now here, of course, Laban catches up with Jacob and there's uh, a lot of things happening. Jacob gets sick of it. And he says to Laban certain things about the time he spent with him. And we pick it up from verse 38 of Genesis 31. This twenty years have I been with thee, thy ewes and thy she-goats have not cast their young, and the rams of thy flock have I not eaten. He doesn't talk about all the hardships that he went through serving Laban. Then we come to verse 41. Thus have I been twenty years in thy house. I served thee fourteen years for thy two daughters, and six years for thy cattle, and you changed my wages ten times. Now, in actual fact, when you carefully read this, especially if you read the Hebrew, that is about two periods of twenty years. What you have is that he worked, of course, as you well know, for Rachel for seven years, and then Leah for seven years, and he had six years of labour in which, in that six years, his wages were changed ten times. So that, that makes 20, 7 plus 7 plus 6. But there was a period of 20 years in which he lived in Laban's house as a friend and as a volunteer shepherd on behalf of Laban. But no wages at all. And of course it was that fact that, that in the end caused him to want to go home. And Laban said, well hang on, I don't want you to go home, I'll pay you some wages. Nominate your wages. So there's actually a total of 40 years here. Two periods of 20. And how do we know that? Well, that word this that begins verse 38 is the little Hebrew word Z, Z-E-H. And that same word occurs at the beginning of verse 41, the word thus. Now listen to Clark in his commentary on this matter. He says, in regard to this word Z, Now the twenty concurrent years of neighbourly assistance and the disjointed twenty of covenant service seen both of them distinguished in the history itself. For upon Laban's pursuit of Jacob, he mentions 20 years twice. Which two sets of 20, if really different, make 40? Each mention of the 20 years is introduced with the word Z. Which word, when repeated, 
is used by the way by way of distinction, as when we say this and that, or the one or the other. So when this word is used in that sort of context, that's what it means. So you've got this period of 20 years and that period of 20 years. So you've got a total of 40. Now I can see some heads nodding and yes, that's, that, that sounds okay. Let's have the coup de grace. All right? Let's just consider the facts concerning Dinah and the sons of Jacob. There were no children born to Jacob until the eighth year at the very earliest, Genesis 29 verse 18. Reuben the eldest would have been 12 on re-entry to the land of Canaan, therefore if he was only there for 20 years. And Simeon and Levi, who of course murdered the men of Shechem, would have been about 11 or 10. Now I know that 11 and 10 year olds can you know, get a bit rough at times, but I wouldn't have thought that an 11 and 10 year old would have butchered hundreds of men in the city of Shechem. The earliest that Dinah could have been born, given the order we, that we are provided in Genesis chapter 30, the earliest that she could have been born was 18 years after Jacob's arrival in Haran. This would probably make her two, three or four years of age when she went to see the daughters of the land and was defiled by Shechem, the prince of the city. It's unlikely, isn't it? Very, very unlikely. So there are three proofs at least. Brother Mansfield deals with this, by the way, in the expositor to some extent. Three proofs that Jacob was in Haran for 40 years. And you say, well, so what? Well, because it tells us something about the life of Judah. He was the fourth son of Jacob, born to Leah. He has to be a certain age, of course, when the events of Genesis 37 and 38 take place. And that's why, later on, you'll see it does have a degree of importance. Now, I want to have a look, first of all, at Judah's mother, Leah. Come with me to the record of Genesis 29. And we have the record from verses 16 to 30, but I'm going to pick it up from verse 17 of Genesis 29. And you know the story, I don't need to retell it to you, of how Jacob was absolutely smitten with the beauty of Rachel. He had a choice between two girls in that family that he could have married. He knew very surely who, who he wanted to marry, and he worked seven years, and it seemed like seven minutes to him, for Rachel. He didn't get Rachel. He got Leah. So how are these two girls described? Look at verse 17. Leah was tender eyed. Now the words in the Hebrew, rak ayin, ayin being the word for eye, means soft eyed. It doesn't mean that, like me, she had to wear spectacles. Right? It means she had weak eyes. It means that she was just ordinary. Well, most of us look in the mirror and what are we? Just ordinary. But there are some people who are different, and Rachel was different. Read on, it says in verse 17, but Rachel was beautiful and well favoured. Now what we have here are two sets of, two phrases in the Hebrew. We have yafa toah, rendered with the one word beautiful. It means beautiful of form. So when you looked at this girl, she was a head turner. Alright? A beautiful girl in terms of form. Then it says well favoured. Yafa mari, meaning beautiful to sight. Now, one of those phrases would have been fine, wouldn't it? But when God doubles it up like that, he wants you to know she was a stunner. She was an absolute stunner. And so you see, Jacob was smitten because she was a stunner. But the ordinary girl, who happened to be the spiritual girl, he didn't even notice. We've got some young men in this audience, and I know what it's like to be a young man. It's a long time ago, but I know what it's like to see a stunningly beautiful girl. I married one. <laughs> However, you don't always get real beauty, do you? In physical beauty. Don't always. You sometimes do. You don't always get it. And Jacob was looking, like most of us look, at the outside, the external. He should have been looking deeper. So you see, God had to fulfil his promise to Jacob. You know what the promise of God to Jacob was in Genesis 28 and verse 15? He said to him in the dream at Bethel, he said, Jacob, I will be with you in every place that you go. In every circumstance that overtakes you, I will be with you. I will not forsake you until I have done that which I have spoken to you of. 
I'm not going to leave you. And that means that when he woke up on the morning and found that lying beside him was Leah and not Rachel, that Leah was actually God's given, God-given wife for Jacob. She was his God-given wife. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Jacob thought he'd been left and forsaken, didn't he? He got hold of Laban's shirt front. He was furious. But God had given to Jacob the wife that he wanted for Jacob. All right? And there are some circumstances in life, aren't there, brethren and sisters, where things happen that we wouldn't choose, but God chooses for us. And this is one of them. So here we have two women. Now, who do these two women represent? Now, I've got to forewarn you that I got myself into a little bit of trouble. People get upset with me over this matter, so I'm going to forewarn you that I'm going to have to do something very clear. I'm going to make a statement. I'm not going to give you an opinion. My opinion is worth about as much as yours, not a great deal. I'm going to give you scripture to demonstrate that what I'm saying is correct. It hasn't always been seen this way in our community. Okay? So I warn you. Leah is the type of spiritual Israel and Rachel is the type of natural Israel. Right? If you don't get this right, you will never understand the, the, the character of Judah properly and the things that flow from Judah. You'll never understand it. You have to have that right. So let's prove it. Let's be very, very sure of our grounds, brothers and sisters and young people. Rachel, whose name means a ewe from the root to journey, is a good traveller, which of course she wasn't. She died just short of Bethlehem, the birthplace of our Lord Jesus Christ, for very good reasons, as you're going to see in a minute. She represents Israel, Yahweh's wife, who had to be sent to Babylon because of idolatry, but out of whom the promised seed would finally come on their return to the land. Whereas Leah, whose name means weary, from the root to be wearied or exhausted, which of course spiritual Israel finds to be the case, don't they? Be very wearied and exhausted. She ha happens to rest beside the patriarchs. She's there with Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Rebecca, lying alongside of her husband that, that God gave to her all right, just as he gave Leah to Jacob gave Leah Jacob as her husband and finally as we'll see in a moment finally Jacob recognised it he recognised the hand of God in his life and he would have kicked himself if only I hadn't been such an idiot to ignore divine providence in my life which is what he did but he got straightened out in the end, as most of us do, thankfully. So let's have a look at the proof, shall we? Jeremiah 31. Now when you come to Jeremiah 31, you need perhaps also to have another hand in Matthew chapter 2, because this passage in Jeremiah 31, which is part of the, part of the dream of Jeremiah that's given to him in Jeremiah 30 and 31 up to verse 26, Jeremiah 31, and we read at verse 15. Now, before I read verse 15, I just want you to cast your eyes across to the other column, to verse 8. This whole dream given to Jeremiah is based upon Jacob coming from Haran back to the land. And the language is it's full of the history. Take verse 8 of chapter 31 for an example. Behold, I will bring them... Israel, scattered throughout all the countries, from the north country, that's where he came from, from the north, and gather them from the coasts of the earth, this is the work of Elijah, of course, and with them the blind and the lame, yes, Jacob halted upon his thigh, and they're described as being her that halted, when they come back under Elijah, and it says this, and the woman with child, and her that travaileth with child together. So who is this woman that's travailing with child? Well, you read verse 15, it tells you. Verse 15 says, Thus saith Yahweh, A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel, 
what it should read, Rachel, weeping for her children, refused to be comforted for her children because they were not. Now that, that of course, was fulfilled, wasn't it? In Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2 was the time when Herod, having heard the news from the Magi about the birth of Christ, Matthew 2, we read in verse 15, And Jesus was there until the death in Egypt, until the death of Herod. And then you read in verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and in all the coasts thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Then was fulfilled. So here it comes. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, In Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted, because they're not. Direct quotation, as you can see, from Jeremiah 31 and verse 15. So what's that telling you? What's it telling you? Well, now what it tells me, Rachel is the type of natural Israel in the divine scheme of things. Now let's add absolute proof for that. I want you to come to Micah chapter 4. Micah 4 and verse 8. And by the way, if you just cast your eye back to verse 6, you will see that it makes reference to assembling her that halteth, based upon Jacob halting upon his thigh. So this chapter is also built around the life of Jacob. In fact, in verse 8, you read, And thou, O tower of the flock, your margin might tell you what mine tells me. It's the tower of Edar. And you will know that in Genesis 35 and verse 21, just after Jacob buries Rachel, and by the way, I believe, found the teraphim of Laban in her stuff, you normally do go through people's stuff when they die, don't you? And he would have found the teraphim of Laban in her stuff. It opened his eyes. And it was from that point, brothers and sisters and young people, that Jacob began to appreciate Leah. It wasn't until then that he began to appreciate Leah, that she was his God-given wife. So what does Micah 4 make of Rachel? Let's read on. Verse 9. Now, why dost thou cry out aloud? Is there no king in thee? Is thy counsellor perished? For pangs have taken thee as a woman in travail. I wonder who this woman is. Well, it's the one described in verse 10. Be in pain and labour to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in travail. For now shalt thou go forth out of the city, and thou shalt dwell in the field. Yes, the nation will go on the way to captivity. They're going to go to Babylon. That's what it tells us in this verse. And thou shalt go even to Babylon. There thou shalt be delivered. And there Yahweh shall redeem thee from the hand of thine enemies. So they went to Babylon because of idolatry. You know, the Jews, when they came back from Babylon after 70 years of captivity, never returned to the idolatry of, of idols of wood and stone. Oh yeah, they worshipped money. They worshipped power and influence. But they never returned to the idols of wood and stone that had marked their history at the end of the nation of Judah. You see, they were cured of idolatry. And God was not going to bring forth his son from a nation that was bowing down to idols. They had to be purged. So who does he use as the type? Rachel. Have a look at chapter 5 of Micah, verses 2 and 3. But thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. It was always in the divine plan, wasn't it? So who's going to produce him? Look at the next verse, verse 3. 
Therefore will he give them up until the time that she which travaileth hath brought forth. And then the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel. He's still talking about Rachel. Rachel as a type of natural Israel, from whom the Lord Jesus Christ would come, born of a woman, born under the law. All right, now this raises some questions in people's minds. I know that. Just hold your horses. We'll get to that in due course, God willing. But you know, there's no question, brothers and sisters and young people, that in the divine scheme of things, Rachel is the type of natural Israel and Leah is the type of spiritual Israel. I want to talk about the qualities of this woman, Leah. There's the allegory. Let's look at the character. I want you to come, if you would, to Genesis 29. Don't need to recount the circumstances, do we, of how he wakes up and finds that it's Leah and not Rachel and he goes and fury to Laban and says to him, what have you done to me? He says, okay, that's fine. You know, the answer of Laban is a classic, isn't it? He says, you know, it is not done in our country to give the younger before the elder. Here was Jacob, the younger, who had deceived his father to get a blessing. Before the elder. Alright? God was at work in this man's life. So that's the story, we know that. So he's made to wait a week. I wonder what attention he gave to Leah in that week. Not much. Read the record with me of Genesis 29 and verse 31. And when Yahweh saw that Leah was hated, now this word hated in the Hebrew, sani, means. Well, it has the idea of hate, but it's a Hebraism for not being preferred. All right? It doesn't mean necessarily that Jacob hated Leah. He didn't hate her in the, in the sense that we would use that term. He just did not prefer her. So she was always pushed into the background, always second, ended up being fourth eventually, always in the background. But that wasn't God's idea for her. Read on. Verse 31. When Yahweh saw that Leah was not preferred, he opened her womb. But Rachel was barren. You know what God's telling Jacob? He's telling him, Jacob, you're, you're an idiot. I can bring forth the twelve tribes from Leah. She's the woman I gave you. So he gives her the children. And Leah thinks this is going to work for her. Read on, verse 32. And Leah conceived and bare a son, and she called his name Reuben. See, a son! She thinks that this is going to turn Jacob's mind, and that now she will take a different position in his eyes. Wrong. Didn't happen. For she said, Surely Yahweh hath looked upon my affliction. Now therefore my husband will love me. Disappointment. And she conceived again and bare a son. Now the few occasions that she did get in to see Jacob, God was at work. And he brought children, sons, from her womb. And so we read in verse 33. She bare a son and said, Because Yahweh hath heard that I was not preferred, he hath therefore given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon, hearing, Yahweh's heard me. So he gets that name. Verse 34. And she conceived again and bare a son and said, Now this time will my husband be joined unto me, because I have borne him three sons. Therefore was his name called Levi. Joined. Didn't work. You know, on the three occasions, the birth of these boys, Yahweh, Yahweh's name is brought to bear by Leah. But look at the next one. Verse 35. And she conceived again and bare a son. And she said, Now will I praise Yahweh. Therefore she called his name Judah. It's brought forth in a very special way this time. You know what's happening here, brothers and sisters? She's lost confidence in man. She can see the hand of God working in, the, in that family. She knows what's going on here. That these are children given by Yahweh. That he's trying to wake Jacob up. 
She's trying to wake Jacob up. Jacob won't be waking up, so she says, I'm giving up on him. She loses confidence in man. So this man Judah that we're going to be studying over the next few days bears a very important name, doesn't he? Very important origins. This is about the exclusion of man and the exaltation of Yahweh. It's about giving God the glory and putting man where he belongs. That's how he gets his name. It's no surprise to me that our Lord sprang out of Judah. Giving God the glory and putting man where he belongs. That's the principle. That's how Judah gets his name. And then it says at the end of verse 35, she left bearing. Why? Why do you think? Does God withdraw himself from Leah? Has he given up on her? No. She's given up on Jacob. She doesn't even bother to get into his presence. And by the time that four sons have been born to her, Rachel has rigid control of the marital bed. She can't get anywhere near Jacob. And she gives up trying. She left bearing. All right, that's the story of this woman. But she remains loyal to Jacob through all of those difficult circumstances that go on for decades. Let me just give you a brief timeline of Leah's troubles. She married Jacob when Jacob was 64. Jacob has 11 sons and one daughter, Dinah, over the next intervening period before he leaves Haran 33 years afterwards, aged 97. Rachel died when Jacob was 101 or thereabouts. Jacob buried Isaac when Jacob was 120. And of course, Jacob buries Leah sometime before he leaves for Egypt when he's 130. She doesn't go with him. She's buried in the cave of Machpelah. So sometime between 120 and 130 years of age, Jacob has to bury a second wife, Leah. So when you work it out, brothers and sisters, it tells us this, that the period of acceptance by Jacob of Leah as his God-given wife was probably about 15 to 20 years. She endured decades Decades of rejection, of misery. That was the most dysfunctional household in Christadelphia. Anyone, any brother here thinks he can handle four wives in a household has got to have rocks in his head. You imagine the dysfunctionality of that family. And she went through all of that. Pushed to the side, pushed down. How do you react when you get pushed down? Push back? Or you remain loyal and faithful to the vows that you've made. What do you do? I know what human nature does. Its natural reaction is to push back and to say, well, you're not going to do that to me. I'm not going to cop this anymore. Leah doesn't do that, brothers and sisters. I want to show you what God does for Leah that she doesn't know anything about just yet. I want to show you three things about Leah and what's waiting for her. It's wonderful. It's absolutely beautiful. Just come to Genesis 49. Now Genesis 49, of course, is the the prophecy of Jacob concerning his sons. And we'll come to deal with this in a bit more detail in due time in our studies later on. But here we have the blessing of his 12 sons. Now I've read that they were blessed in the order of of their birth. (coughs) Wrong. You've only got to look at the record of Genesis 29 and 30 and list off the order of birth, and it's pretty plain that they're not blessed in the order of their birth. You know what happens here? Now, you imagine if you were Jacob and you had your 12 sons before you, they're probably going to be lined up in the order of their birth, aren't they? You know what the order of their birth was? Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Dan, who of course was the the son of Bilhah, Rachel's maid, Naphtali, another one of Bilhah, Gad, he was of Zilpah, the fourth wife of Jacob, 
um, then we have Asher, who was also from Zilpah. And then Leah has two more boys, Issachar and Zebulun. And then, of course, Rachel finally has two sons, Joseph and Benjamin. That's the order of their birth. So what's the order of their blessing? You imagine this. Young men, if you were standing before your father, he's going to give you the final blessing. And you're lined up in the order of your birth. There's a certain, you know, we know what it's like in families, don't you? There's a certain pecking order. You can't put the younger one before the older one. It doesn't happen. It happens here. The order of their blessing, if you go through it, you'll find this to be true, is Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah. Well, that's the same as the order of the birth. But not the next one. Zebulun is next. Zebulun comes at number five in the blessing. So where was he in the order of birth? Well, he was number ten. Wasn't he? So who comes next? Who's number six in the order of blessing? Issachar. Well, where was he in the order of birth? He was number nine. So Jacob has jumped over Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. They're shuffled down the order, and guess who is brought up the order? Guess who the first six are? Blessed by Jacob. The six sons of Leah. I wonder what Jacob's saying. I'm going to suggest to you what he's saying. You know what he's saying to his boys? They would have been quite ruffled by this, wouldn't they? Dad, got this wrong. I should be getting on the... I'm on the next on the... I'm the next cab off the ramp. What are you doing here? What's Jacob saying? He's saying, if only I had realised it, I could have had all 12 from the wife that God gave me. Leah. That's what he's saying. A recognition that she was his God-given wife. Come to Ezekiel 48. Now you will know that portions of Ezekiel 48 are about the, what's called the profane or common section of the Holy Oblation. In verses 15 to 20, we have the, the proportions of that profane section of the land in the Holy Oblation. It's, it's the southern, it's the Holy Oblation divided up into three parts. It's the southern part of the Holy Oblation. And the proportions of it are given to us in verses 15 to 20. Now this of course is where the dormitory city Yahweh Shammah is to be located. It's some 35 kilometres south of the temple itself. This is where people come in the kingdom age and they stay there like you and I are camping here they have a much more salubrious place given to them in that time. They will stay in Yahweh Shammah. We read of that in the very last verse of Ezekiel 48 it says it says it was around about 18,000 measures, and the name of the city from that day shall be Yahweh is there. Now, some people think this is a reference to Jerusalem, to Zion. It's not. Yahweh Shema means, as Brother Sully points out, Yahweh thither. That's its literal meaning. Yahweh thither, or to Yahweh from this place. So literally, the Hebrew name means, we're going to go from here, from thence, Unto Yahweh, he's 35 kilometres up the road. So it's a dormitory city where people live for the time being until they go to the temple to worship. I'll come back and they might make several journeys to the temple from this place. So what's that all about? Well, there's something very important about it. Something very, very important for Leah about it. So read with me from verse 30. And these are the goings out of the city, meaning Yahweh Shema, on the north side, 4,500 measures. The word there, goings out, means exits, as Rotherham translates it. And the gates of the city shall be after the names of the tribes of Israel. Three gates northward. One gate for Reuben, one gate of Judah, and one gate of Levi. So whose sons are they? All sons of Leah. So why is it important that they be on the north side? Well, let's have a look at this city. It has gates on the east and gates on the west. You know what they're for? 
they are there for the Levites who will tend the fields that are on either side of the dormitory city, fields in which they'll grow crops and keep herds and flocks to provide food for the worshippers, the mortal worshippers who come and stay in this place. So those are what you might call utility gates. There are three on the west, three on the east. But what about the gates on the north and south? Well, the gate on the north is the gate you go through when you're going from Yahweh Shema to worship in the temple. And the gate that you return through when you come from the temple. The southern gate is the gate that you enter the city by. Come from the south, you enter Yahweh Shema from the southern gate. You go through the northern gate to worship. You return to the city through the northern gate and you go home through the southern gate. You don't access the east and the west if you are a mortal worshipper. That's for the Levites and the children of Israel who bring in the requirements of the city. So what about the southern gates? Have a look at verse 33. And the south side, 4,500 measures and three gates. One gate of Simeon one gate of Issachar and one gate of Zebulun. Whose sons are they? You got it. Leah. And for 1,000 years, every single mortal worshipper that comes to this house to worship Yahweh will pass through some very important gates crucial gates in their lives. And they're all the gates of the sons of Leah. Do you think she's going to miss that? To think she won't see that? You know what that's telling us, brothers and sisters and young people? I've got one more to go. I want you to come back to Genesis 49. The very last words spoken by Jacob to his sons, whom he's just blessed. Verse 29 of Genesis 49. And he charged them and said unto them, I am to be gathered unto my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite. In the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre. In the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought, bought with the field of Ephron, the Hittite, for a possession of a burying place. Now look at these words. This is what we want. There they buried Abraham and Sarah, his wife. How many wives did Abraham have? Three. Hagar and Keturah, as well as Sarah. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah, his wife. How many wives did he have? One. And there, says Jacob, I buried Leah. How many wives did he have? Four. So why doesn't he say, my wife? Well, it was palpably obvious, obvious to his boys, who were standing there, some of them quivering because of what was really a blessing, but they didn't see it that way, and we'll see that. They stood there quivering. They knew exactly what Jacob was talking about. The very order of their blessing proved that he now recognised Leah as his God-given wife. He could have buried Rachel here, couldn't he? Where he buried her outside Bethlehem in Ephratah? That wasn't very far from Hebron where the cave of Machpelah was, just down the road. He could have buried Rachel there. He didn't. Why didn't he? Well, most likely because he found Laban's teraphim in a stuff. Which is why she's used as the type of natural Israel. Now, people come to me after and say, but you're, you're suggesting Rachel won't be in the kingdom. I'm not talking about the judgment seat. I don't know where Rachel's going to stand. What I do know, brothers and sisters and young people, is the way God uses her. And he uses her as a type of natural Israel. Her destiny is in God's hands. Not in mine or in yours. So here we've got the foundations of the life of Judah. And I better get on with it, eh? But not before I say this. 
The whole point of what we've just done is to demonstrate one very important thing. Loyalty under severe trial, faithfulness to covenants when they are sorely tried, trust in God when it doesn't look like anything's going to change, are the qualities we see in Leah. And what God has reserved for her, brothers and sisters and young people, teaches us a very important lesson. There is a reward for faithfulness and loyalty under severe and enduring trials. But you've got to wait for it. She's waiting for it. And it will come. Now very quickly, what I want to do is show to you the framework within which our study is going to function. And I noticed the time. I had to be quick. What we have here is a series of chapters which are put there by God for a reason. Now, if you and I were writing this record, we would not have written it this way. But he did through Moses. You've got Genesis 36. I wouldn't have put it there. I mean, it's not in the right place, really. If you have a logical sort of approach, not in the right place. But God puts Genesis 36 where it is. Why? Well, because you see, Esau is eager. Have a look at Genesis 36 very quickly. Five times in this chapter, and you can work this out for yourselves, five times in this chapter, the statement is made, Esau is Edom. You see it in verse 1. You'll find it again in verse 8. And again, if you look at the margin, in verse 9. You'll find it again in verse 19. And again, in the last verse, verse 43. Now, do you need to be told five times that Esau is Eden? No. So what's that about? Well, you see, Eden just happens to come from Adam. <coughs> Rosie, which is the root word for Adam. And you will recall that Esau had a kingdom before Israel. Yes. And the kingdom of men came before the kingdom of Israel. So that's why when you carefully look through Genesis 36, guess what you find? 70 names of the progeny of Esau. And 70 is the biblical number for the nations. This is a chapter about the kingdom of men. And moreover, this is the ninth generation of 14. I'm going to have a look at the last generation in our final study on Monday, God willing. The 14th generations in Matthew chapter 1. This is the ninth generation in scripture and the name Esau occurs in this chapter 11 times and I don't need to tell you that he has 11 dukes that come from him I wonder why 11 well 11 is the number of inadequacy and failure and the kingdom of men is inadequate and will fail that's why that chapter is there so what comes next Genesis 37 what's that about Joseph, the most expensive type of our Lord Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. All of the details of the life and mission of our Lord Jesus Christ in Genesis 37. That's why he comes next. This is God's means of redemption of the human race. Locked away as they are in the kingdom of men. Then you've got Genesis 38. What's that about? I wouldn't have put it there, but it's there. Because it's about the character of the nation into which Christ was born. And we're going to see in the character of Judah that he is a type of the nation that Christ encountered. So it was apostate and corrupt, just like Judah was. And we have Genesis 39, Christ in the grave for three days and three nights. We have Genesis 40, where the principles of bread and wine are found. It's all about the sacrifice of Christ. And then we have Genesis 41. We have the resurrection and exaltation to the right hand of Pharaoh, which of course we know is a fabulous type of Christ being exalted to the right hand of God after resurrection. So there's your framework in Genesis. So we're going to be studying basically the next couple of sessions within that framework. And we're going to do this very quickly, but I want you to come to Genesis 37 and have a look at me at the record that we just read.
Now, as I said, I've just scooted through that, but all of those details are to be found in the notes that are available if you want to get a copy of them. It's all in, that, in those notes. Genesis 37, verse 2, we read, These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhar and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father what's called here his evil report. Now, in actual fact, when you have a look at the Hebrew, it's better rendered by the RSV, Joseph brought an ill report of them to their father. Now, you can imagine the response when the boys heard. Now, who were they? Well, they were the sons of Zilpah, the sons of Bilhah. In other words, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. And Joseph was out there in the field with them, and their language, their behaviour was such that he couldn't tolerate it. So he went to, back, to, back to his father and said, You know, that my brothers... They're doing and saying evil things. And of course, when they heard about that, they weren't very pleased. And the record says, it says in verse 4, that when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. So it wasn't just the report that he brought back. And by the way, the type's wonderful, isn't it? The type is found in John chapter 7 and verse 7. Don't turn it up. John 7 verse 7 says this. Christ says... The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. Now, Lord Jesus Christ did exactly what Joseph did. He took a report to his father of the evil behaviour of the nation into which he came. So the type is there. So why did they hate him? Well, not just because of that, but because, you see, Jacob bypassed all the other sons to give to Joseph. What's called here, wrongly of course, as you know, a coat of many colours. It it wasn't a coat of many colours. It was what is described, if you look at the the Hebrew, as a tunic reaching palms and soles. It was a priestly garment. The two Hebrew words that are used are ketanet pasim. It simply means I mean, it was probably white. We're not told it was white, but priestly garments in those days normally were. So, it was probably a white garment that had long arms, like a coat, went right down to the feet, covered the whole body. So when Reuben messed up, as the record of of Genesis 35, 22 tells us, he messed up, defiled his father's bed, he was going to lose the, the right of the firstborn. So Jacob looks at his sons. Reuben's out. Simeon, cruel, callous. He's out. Levi, not unlike him. Simeon, he's out. Judah, oh, look at him. He's out. And he goes right down all the boys until he gets to Joseph. And Joseph is given the priestly garment of the family, which the first one of the family normally wore. He acted as the priest for the family. He went to Joseph. And they hate him. Now it's that that comes to the record of Genesis 37. Come down to verse 18, Genesis 37. And when they saw him afar off, he's going to find his brethren. They weren't at Shechem, where they should have been. Well, they were at Dothan, where they could be seen by many people. All the traders passed through. Dothan was on the, on the way through the land. All the traders went through here. And Ishmaelites were among them. They saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer come. Now that was the other problem. He'd upset them enough by telling evil reports. But then he got the, the priestly garment. And then he had dreams. Dreams that said that we'd bowed down to him. They were livid. Envious. Jealous. And bitter. And it comes out. Verse 20. Come now therefore and let us slay him and cast him into some pit. And we will say some evil beast hath devoured him. And we will see what will come of his dreams. Now Reuben tries to intervene, doesn't he? Tries to intervene. Reuben represents in the type the Nicodemus Joseph of Arimathea clubs. 
Well, they tried to deliver, didn't they? Christ from the hands of his murderers. It says in verse 22, Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit. You know that Nicodemus stood up in John chapter 7, verses 50 and 51, when they'd failed to arrest Christ, and he said, Does our Lord judge any man before it hears him? He's not here. He tried to deliver Christ from their hands, just like Reuben did. But it didn't work. Why did it work? Well, because when Reuben was absent, Judah steps in. Look at the record of verse 25. It says, They sat down to eat bread. Now, brothers and sisters, you can read that record, and unless you read another part of the record, you don't know what was going on. Now, they sat down callously to eat food. Joseph was screaming out of a deep hole in which there was no water, which we know is a biblical symbol for the grave. They had watched him, the anguish on his face, the horror. He could not believe that his own brothers could be doing this to him. And they never forgot that look on his face. Fifteen years later, if you just flick a couple of pages to Genesis chapter 42, Verse 21, in the presence of Joseph, this is what we read. Chapter 42 and verse 21. And they said one to another, we are verily guilty concerning our brother, in that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us, and we would not hear. Therefore, is this distress come upon us. So when you read those words back in Genesis 37, that they sat down to eat, it was one of the most callous acts that can ever be committed against your brethren. And so Judah pipes up. A company of Ishmaelites come by. Look at verse 26 of Genesis 37. These Ishmaelites are carrying spicery, balm and myrrh, which we know to be used in the embalmment of our Lord Jesus Christ. Preparation of his body for burial. Mm -hmm. Judah, verse 26, said unto his brethren, What prophet? I'm going to stop there. If you want one single phrase to encapsulate the character of Judah before he's converted, it's that. <coughs> This is the summary, the index to Judah's character for the best part of his life until he's converted. What prophet? Now the word in the Hebrew simply means prophet or game. And it's Judah who makes the suggestion. Now Brother Mansfield comments on this and he says um, in relation to that, that this is a type of Judas Iscariot. Or what was his motivation? Obvious, isn't it? What was the motivation of the nation of Judah? Well, unless we do something about this man, the Romans will come and take away our place, by which they meant the temple, the most profitable business in the world of that day. They'll come and take our place and our nation. That was their motivation. It's profit. And we're going to see when we get it to tonight, God willing, to the study in Genesis 38, that this was the driving motivation of Judah. The very first characteristic that you read about this man is an index to his whole life until he's converted. So brothers and sisters, let's end with the words of the Apostle Paul. In 1 Timothy 6 and verse 10 he says this, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they had erred from the faith. Judah erred from the faith. Here was an elder son who was lost inside the house of Israel. When you get to Genesis 38, we're going to see a son who's lost outside the house of Israel. And why does he go outside the house? Prophet. That's why. So what does he get when he goes outside the house? We'll read the next part of 1 Timothy 6 verse 10. 
They've erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. When we get to Genesis 38, you're going to see one disaster after another happen to Judah. One tragedy after another. He finds himself weeping at the loss of two sons that Yahweh kills. And then at the loss of a wife. You know what, brothers and sisters? He later on says, God, God was at work in my life. And I couldn't see it. We can learn a lot from this book. 